As we started off, Pastor uh, led us in a study as we could see that uh, our faith and our substance, the, the standard in which we live off of, is to be the Word of God. That should be everything to us. And so as we are going to be going through this series, we want to look at some of the topics that we've looked at already over the past month in this evangelism series. And we just want to go just a little bit deeper, go a little bit closer, try to understand these even more. Um, you know, when we see these things for ourselves, and you can see it from the Word of God, we want to make a decision, and we want to believe these things. Um, but then we want to take it a step further. We want to go beyond just seeing it and saying, okay, I, I accept it, and I, under, I, I see it. But we want to be able to understand it, because now that we believe it, now that it, the, by the grace of God it's been shown to us, what do we want to do? We want to share it with someone else, Amen. And so that is the purpose, that we go back over these things, we go a little bit deeper, we, we look at some of the texts maybe we haven't seen before, maybe we address some of the uh, uh, oppositions to those things, and it's good for us to ask questions, it's good for us to repeat these things. Repetition deepens impression, and uh, we have one goal, and that's for us to share the love of God, to share Jesus Christ with the world so that we can soon go home, amen? And so that is my desire as we look at this topic, as you can see, entitled The Heavenly Trio, and uh, I want God to be uplifted in this. I want Him to be able to see, be seen uh, in this message. Um, so, the only way that's possible is if we all collectively pray for God's Spirit to be here and to speak through me, so He can open up your ears and you can hear Him speaking to you. Amen? So let's join together and let's ask for God's Spirit to be the one that is teaching us here today. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have yet another opportunity. We can open up your word, we can study, and we can learn from you. Father, as we look into the topic of you, as we, hear, as we seek to understand you better, Father, I ask that you would be the one revealing yourself here to us today, that your spirit would be here among us, that your angels would be guarding around us, ministering to us, and, Father, that you would help us to leave here with a better revelation of you, of your love, of Jesus Christ and the work that you have set out to do in the salvation of our souls. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we are studying about God, we're truly going to be looking at theology today. We're going to try to understand more about God. And as we do that, I think it's helpful for us to understand uh, as Christians and even more so as Seventh day Adventists where we kind of fit in the spectrum of uh, our understanding of God. You look out in the world, not just in Christianity, but many people have a, a varied understanding of who God is. What makes up God? Are there more than one God? Is it just one God? Is it one God made up? in uh, multiple persons. And so uh, the first thing that we see here, of course, you may not be able to read that very well, but it says atheism. Atheism, the understanding that you just don't believe that there is a God, that you have come to the conclusion that you understand and that you believe because you have somehow exhausted the resources to be able to come to the conclusion that there is a God. Now, would you say to a, an atheist, that they have exhausted all the wisdom and the knowledge that even just this world contains? Probably not. That they have gone out to the outer extents of the universe to be able to see, hey, is there really a God? No, they have not. And so a short, distant cousin or relative to atheism is agnosticism. Now, this is uh, the mindset that, you know what, maybe there is a God, maybe there is not a God, but guess what? I don't really care. It doesn't make a difference in my life and the way that I live my life. Uh, a true atheist really falls more towards an agnostic because you can't exhaust. As soon as you exhaust all there is to know about whether or not there is a God, guess what conclusion you're going to come to? That there is a God. So uh, most people that are atheists are more than likely agnostic. Uh, but as we keep moving further in this direction, what we will see is now uh, there is... Unitarianism. Now we're going to get into the, uh, a couple different distinctions here that consist of monotheism. Uh, monotheism meaning one, one God. And, and to one extreme or one extent of that is Unitarianism. That is a rigid singularity when it comes to God. 
There's only one God. It's not made up of multiple persons. There is no second God or a God with him. There is just one God. Um, Islam would fall in this. Uh, many, even in Judaism, may believe this way, that there's just a rigid singularity to God. And then as we keep moving forward, next to this, we have Arianism. So it's very close to Unitarianism. There is a supreme source, a pre supreme God, that one God, but that one God has now created another. And now, as we understand the Son, or Jesus Christ, he is that second God. He has created, or as uh, you may have heard, that he has literally begotten into the universe as now a second God, or a God, not just the God. So in Arianism and Unitarianism, there is still a supreme being, and that would be the Father. Um, but then there's also modalism. Modalism is the idea that there is still the, just that one God, but he expresses himself in multiple different ways. So this one God, he would express himself in some ways as the Father. They would see him in the Old Testament as the Father, and that same God now expresses himself as the Son, and then even maybe the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So it's just still one God, but he expresses and he reveals himself and shows himself in different ways. Then we come to one that we may all be more familiar with, and that's Trinitarianism, that there is still just one God. This is still under the heading of monotheism, but that one God is made up of three persons. Okay, so of course, much on that here in just a moment. As we keep on going down this list, of course, now we have polytheism. So now there are multiple gods. And we see that today. This has been the, the main teaching and understanding in all the ancient religions that there are hundreds, if not thousands, maybe even millions of gods. Well, we see this today even in Hinduism, that there is a god for pretty much everything, right? There's a god of the sun, a god of the water, a god of frogs. There are just a god for everything that you can possibly imagine. And as we keep on going, now we see panantheism. Panantheism is that God is in everything. So there's not just the God of the sun or the God of the air, the God of water, the God of trees or God of frogs, but God is actually in those things. The God is in the sun. God is in the water. He is in the rain. And so this is panantheism and it's a close relative pantheism. Now, it's not just that God is in everything, but guess what? God is everything. So he's a pervasive force, a pervasive entity that just exists as everything. Not just in everything, but as everything. Uh, but guess what happens as we get closer this direction? If God is in everything, and now God has become everything, what is the very next step that, as a, a logical thinking person, might take if we think that God is everything? That we are God. I am God. And what's interesting about this is this actually begins to make a full circle all the way around because if we believe that we are God, then guess who's the ultimate authority to decide whether or not there even is a God? Us. There is no supreme authority. The Bible is not God's revelation of himself to his people. We are a God and we get to decide whether or not God even exists. And if he does exist, guess what? It's me. And so this is how this kind of goes full swing all the way around. So, and trust me, there's a, a hundred variations and sub-degrees of, of all of this. This is just a broad uh, spectrum of, of where we understand uh, the belief in God. And so, of course, we want to understand how do we fit in this? How can we make sure that we don't end up somewhere in the wrong place on this spectrum? And so today, of course, we're going to look at the Trinity, everyone's favorite word. Many people today just uh, really don't like that word. Many people would say, well, I'm just going to say Godhead or, uh, you know, the title of the sermon is the Heavenly Trio. But honestly, it is a trinity. And, and why we use this word trinity is because the trinity simply means a triunity. It is the understanding that there are three in one. And, and we're going to look at this statement here. This is the uh, statement that the Seventh-day Adventist Church uses now, this is not a creed. This is a, a uh, fluid in a sense is that uh, as our understanding grows, we, we change and we develop and, and uh, we may modify this. The core truth of it does not change. But this is as a Seventh-day Adventist church. As if you were to go to the Seventh-day Adventist church's world website, this is what you would read about the Trinity. It says, there is one God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension, yet known through his self-revelation. God, who is love, is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. Now, why I think this is important to show this, because I believe that God works through a collective body. His church, his people, who have been baptized, they are baptized into the body of Christ. And so they, in a sense, they are no longer many individuals, but we are together as one. And we see this very early on. The way that God was leading his church, one of the first um, obstacles that they came up with was that uh, now Gentile believers were coming into the church. They weren't just Jews. And the church collectively as a body had to make a decision. Should we require that these Gentile believers that are now being grafted into the body of Christ, should they be circumcised? So the body together had to come together submit themselves to the teaching of the Word of God and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, and they had to make a decision. And this is the way that God has always worked through His church. This is the, the divine uh, way that God has, has shown us that His church should be led, that we are not made up of just a bunch of individuals. We are collectively the body of Christ. And so when we look at the way God has led His church for the past 2,000 years. And as we're going to see, we're going to start at the very beginning in Genesis 1-1. As God has moved and led and guided his church for the past 6,000 years, God is ever lightening our path. The truth is getting brighter and brighter. Our understanding is getting more and more refined. The truth has never changed, but God has continually led his people to a greater and a better understanding of that truth. And so now the Seventh-day Adventist church 2,000 years from that very first Christian council, the Jerusalem council, here collectively as a body, and as we look at that, that statement, we have decided that this is the best way to at least explain this understanding. Collectively as a body, not a bunch of individuals, but as a body, we have decided for now, this is the best way to explain this. And why this becomes important later is because today what is happening is people claiming to be a part of this church is saying that now we should move backwards in our understanding. As God, as the Bible says, the path of the just is as the shining light. It shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. God has ever been revealing himself greater and greater and greater to his church. But now people are saying that we should move backwards in our understanding. And now we should no longer believe in the Trinity. Now we should no longer view God in this way. And so there's a danger to that because now it is not the collective body, the remnant church of God that we see in Bible prophecy, but now it is individuals saying that we should move away from what the body views and how the body collectively believes. And so I hope you, you see that. I hope I'm explaining myself well so that we can see that there is a danger for us moving away from the body of Christ and being... Uh, segregated into a, a bunch of different factions, a bunch of different atoms, all thinking differently, and uh, collectively, God is leading his church. So go with me to John, Genesis 1-1, and we're going to see how the Bible uh, describes God. All of you should know that verse. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. In the very beginning, there was God. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when we look at God, we see God, usually in, in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word for God is El. But what's very interesting about Genesis 1-1 is the way that the Bible, and of course God revealing himself through the Bible, expresses himself. It's not just El, but it's Elohim. It is the plural form of God. Now, as we go through these texts, what's interesting, I spent uh, more time, and, and I would never recommend this to just anyone, looking at the oppositions uh, to this teaching. And you know what? There is always going to be a hook to hang your doubt on. God will never remove all those from you. And I'm sure there is someone that can go to every single verse that we use and deconstruct it in some way to cause you to doubt it. Not one single verse is going to show us the Trinity. We have to rely upon the weight of evidence. We don't base anything that we believe on in just one text, do we? 
We would be in really big trouble if we did that. And so what we are going to do is make a case, and we're going to lean on the evidence. And this is one of the things that we see is that God expresses himself in a plural form, Elohim. And what we see here in Genesis 1 and verse 26, and God, Elohim, said, let us. Does he say, let myself? He said, let us make man in my image, our image, and after our likeness. God, Elohim, is speaking to himself in a plural way. Now, if I said that uh, this is our church, can I just be talking to myself? If I say that we should all wake up and listen to the sermon, I have to be talking to someone else, right? These are words that denote that there's someone else there for me to be talking to. And so what's interesting about Genesis chapter 1, we see... um, Those pictures didn't turn out too great, did they? (laughs) Uh, All throughout Genesis chapter 1, we see God. Over and over and over again, you see the word Elohim mentioned over and over and over again. As we see all seven days of creation, we see the Sabbath day mentioned. What's very interesting is now God expresses himself a little bit differently. Genesis 2 and verse 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the... Not just Elohim, but the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, that word Lord God is Yahweh Elohim. This is God's personal name. As soon as we see God introduce the Sabbath, we see God resting and and spending that time with his people, we see him introduce the intimate, personal name of himself. My name is Nicholas. His name is Yahweh. And it's Yahweh Elohim is the one that created the heavens and the earth. He is, Yahweh is Jehovah. Many people refer to it or call him Jehovah. It's the same name. Uh, He is the self-existent one. So if you are self-existent, did anyone bring you into existence? No, you're self-existence. Can you wrap your mind around that, honestly? No. Good. It's exactly the way that it should be. We are finite beings. God is infinite. We should not fully understand that. We accept by faith what the Word of God tells us. And He is the self existent one. He is Jehovah. And what we see here in Genesis 3 and verse 22, it's now not just Elohim speaking to Himself in a plural form. We see now in Genesis 3 and verse 22, and the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. God, once again, speaking it of himself in a plural way. We continue on. Genesis 11 and verse 6 says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. What's interesting about this verse is that word one. On the surface, it's not as interesting as you think, but it is the word ichad. That word means united together One, but not numerically. So when he's speaking of the builders of the Tower of Babel, was he saying there was only one builder of the Tower of Babel? No. There were many people, but guess what? They were united in purpose. They had one purpose, and that was to do exactly the opposite of what God had told them to do. They were ichad. They were one. And in Genesis 11, verse 7, the very next verse, it says, Go to, let us, now God, the Lord, Yahweh, he's the one speaking, Let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. The first time God gave the gift of tongues. And here he's given it to a people that were united together as one, united together in purpose. And go with me to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. And we're going to see as God, what's so interesting about this uh, teaching is how this understanding just develops more and more and more as we just keep moving through the Bible. And, uh, you know, God's people may not have fully understood it back then, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, but God is, as I already said, he is ever revealing himself. That light gets brighter and brighter and brighter. The truth, that light never changes. It all comes from the same source, but it gets brighter and we understand it better. And in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, this is the Shema. This is the prayer that Israel would have prayed every morning and every, at every night. This is the prayer that they would have prayed. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
Now, there's some familiar words in here, so I want you to repeat after me. We're going to say the Shema together. Hear, O Israel. It says Shema. Everyone say Shema. Shema. Yisrael. Yisrael. Yahweh. 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 Eloheinu. Eloheinu. Yahweh. 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 Oh, it's a familiar word, right? Some very familiar words in there. Yahweh, the Lord God, Yahweh Elo, uh, Elohim, he is Echad. His one is not just numerical. There's just one, a rigid singularity about God. But God, this plural that we have seen in God, he is one. United, together, as one, this is how we see God. And in Genesis 2 and verse 24, we see that same word used. Oh, wow, you can't even see it. Genesis uh, 2 and verse 24. Let's go there. Is it there? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Genesis 2 and verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be ichad. They shall be one. Now, I asked my son this. I said, now, when the Bible says this, does that mean Adam and Eve joined together as one? Now they have four arms and four legs, four eyes, two mouths, four ears. And he started laughing hysterically. Of course that's not what it means. The two together would be united as one, one in purpose, one in mind, one in character. This is what the husband and wife were to be, and this is how God expresses himself. He, we see him. So far, we don't see a trinity, do we? I'm not saying, oh, hey, here's the Trinity, you better believe it. No. So far, all we see is that God expresses himself in a plural way, that there is a plurality to God, but according to the Bible, that plurality doesn't mean that we are now polytheists, that now we believe in multiple gods, because now these gods are one. They are one in mind. They are one in purpose. They don't cross over. They don't step over into the other person's lane. They all have the exact same purpose and the exact same goal, and they work together, and as we are going to see, they're working together for the salvation of you and me. That is their goal, and that is their purpose. So go with me to Exodus chapter 3, as we're going to continue to see this develop. Exodus 3, we're going to begin in verses 2 through 4. And what you're going to see, this is Moses here at the burning bush. And in verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Who appeared to Moses? The angel of the Lord. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord, and when who? The Lord, that's Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see God, Elohim, called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he says, here am I. Now, what has the angel of the Lord now just been made equivalent to in these verses? He's God. The angel of the Lord here in, this, in these verses, he is the one in the midst of the burning bush. But we also see that he's called Yahweh. He's also Elohim. This is the one who is in the midst of this burning bush. Now notice what the angel of the Lord, what he calls himself. In verse 13 and 14. So God has now told Moses he is to go. He's to deliver his people. And in verse 13 it says, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? And what shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, in other words, Yahweh said unto Moses, the angel of the Lord said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. I am. Now, I think it's really one of the coolest names for God because it just means that he is. The word is, is hachia, is, is the Hebrew. It just means to exist. Yahweh was the self-existent one, I am, he just is. That means there's no explanation, there's no beginning, there's no reason, he just is. And this is how God describes himself, I am. It's just, it's just such an awesome name. 
This was the angel of the Lord. As, as you continue reading, especially through the books of Moses, the I am, the angel of the Lord, is the one that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. It was the angel of the Lord, the I am, that was in that great pillar of fire, that was in that pillar of cloud by day and led them through the wilderness. This was the angel of the Lord. This was the I am, Yahweh Elohim. And notice what Jesus says as we jump all the way to John chapter 8 and verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the Pharisee, this did not fly over the Pharisee's head. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying here. Because what did it say? The very next verse, they picked up stones to stone him. Because he was making a claim so great that they just couldn't fathom that a man standing right in front of them could claim to be Yahweh, could claim to be the I am, that self-existent one, the one that spoke the universe into existence. This man standing right there in front of them was claiming to be that very one. And they just, they couldn't understand it. How much uh, <laughs> do we understand how it is that the infinite, eternal, self-existing God of the universe could come down to be a man? and dwell among us. It should fly over our heads as well, but hopefully our response is a little bit different. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat, and all the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It was Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. When people try to say, oh, well, it was the angry, vengeful God and the Father in the Old Testament. Now we've got the loving, merciful, gracious God in the New Testament. That is not what the Bible says. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. And he is the one that says to us, he is the I am. John 1 and verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. There's your plurality. And the word was God. There should be no confusion about this. And what's interesting and, and just painful to watch when, when you hear people um, take this verse and, and deconstruct this verse, they would say that, well, in the Greek, this actually says, and the word was a God. From what we have already seen, from the evidence that you have in front of you, is it possible that Jesus was just a God? No. No. He's claiming to be the God, the I am, Jehovah, Yahweh, this is Jesus. And so, you know, it's, it's nice and it's fun to look at these words, look at them in the Hebrew and the Greek, but anytime someone comes up with an interpretation based off of another language that goes against every single thing else that you can see clearly from the word of God, discard it. Because truth is not dependent upon your understanding of a second language. Amen? Now, there may be verses that don't make sense in the English language, that may make more sense in the Spanish or, or, or in the Greek or in the Hebrew, but guess what? God gives us the weight of the evidence, and he has told us if we want to understand doctrine, we are to go line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. God will never leave us in darkness. He's given us all of this. Like I say, he's not going to remove all doubts, is he? but he's going to give us the weight of evidence. And uh, if we want to be approved by God, we would be studying. Amen? So as uh, we can, you know, there's, there's not really much dispute about the Father. We can see clearly now how Jesus describes himself as the Son. Uh, but now let's look at what Jesus has to say about the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, and 17, Jesus says, I pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Now, what we're going to begin to see, and let's look at this next verse here. We'll, we'll talk about it. In John 16, 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. In other words, it's beneficial for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, which we just saw is the spirit of truth, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Over and over and over, what you're going to see is that Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit as a person. It's an individual. It's not just an it. 
It's not a force. It's not, he may have force. It's not just a life. He may have life. He may be life, but he's also a person. And this is how Jesus refers to him. And what we're going to see, go to Acts chapter 5, a section that you may be familiar with as we talk about the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5. Acts 5, verse 3 and 4. It says, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, Ananias and Sapphira, they had pledged the proceeds to this land that they had sold, but they kept some of it back. And they were actually defrauding Peter and the church that they had pledged this money to. And so now Peter says, you're lying to the Holy Ghost. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? In other words, you had a choice. No one forced this upon you. You had a choice. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now, of course, you're going to have people that say, well, this doesn't really say the Holy Spirit is God. One thing it does say is that when you lie to the Holy Spirit, who are you lying to? You're lying to God. We see already Jesus it refers to the Holy Spirit as a person, as an individual. If he's going to go, someone's going to come in his place. Now, I use this as an analogy. I install doors for a living. If I couldn't finish the work that I was doing, I say, hey, you know what? I have to go. I'm going to send another door installer to come finish your work. Are they going to appreciate it if I send a plumber? Because they're not going to do the work that I started. Amen? They, uh, they'll, they'll be greatly disappointed. Jesus is saying he is going to go and he's going to send another, another like himself in his place. Jesus has now, uh, he has associated himself with the human race. Forever associated himself with the human race. He came from heaven, the great I am, and he has clothed himself with humanity to forever identify with you and me in order to save us and now he can't be everywhere all at once, can he? He has willingly limited himself for you and me. And so, so now he must send the Holy Spirit in his place. Now the Holy Spirit, who can be everywhere at once, who can now enter into our hearts and into our minds, now he says it's expedient for him that, it, that he goes because now we can be closer to God than if Jesus was standing right next to us. Because Jesus, he says, I will come unto you. Jesus himself is going to come to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, this doesn't answer all the questions in the world. Many people who deny the personhood of the Holy Spirit or say, well, the Holy Spirit isn't a third individual, but he really is just Jesus or the spirit of Jesus, but he's not a, th a third separate individual from Jesus. And there's a lot of convoluted ways that this will get all mixed up. And why doesn't the Bible make it as clear about the Holy Spirit as it does about Christ? Many of people say, why do we only see two sitting on the throne, the Father and the Son? Where is the Holy Spirit in all these examples where we see God and the Father? Well, in John 16 and verse 13, we're going to see that that just was not his mission. That was not his work. It says, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. The work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Jesus. The work of the Holy Spirit is to point us back to Jesus. And guess what the work of Jesus is? To point us to the Father. Collectively, they work together. Individually, they have different functions, but for the exact same purpose. They are one, and they are united together. So we can't look at the Holy Spirit and say, well, it doesn't say this about him, this doesn't say this about him, this doesn't say this about him. 2 Peter 1 and verse 21 says that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and if the Holy Spirit was not to speak of himself, guess what the Holy Spirit's not going to do? He's not going to reveal himself in that same way. He's going to give us enough information so that we do not be deceived, so we don't, don't end up somewhere else on that spectrum of belief. And what we can see uh, the evidence that the Bible does give us that the Holy Spirit is a person. It is an individual because he can talk, he can direct, he can forbid, he can teach, he can comfort, he can be the author of prophecy, he can give gifts. 
That's what the Holy Spirit can do. But the Holy Spirit also has a, a mind, a thought. He has a will, knowledge, love. The Holy Spirit has communion. And the Holy Spirit can be insulted, tempted, lied to, grieved, and blasphemed against. This is what the Holy Spirit can as a person and as an individual. You can't grieve a force. You can't grieve an impersonal object, can you? God speaks of the Holy Spirit as a separate person, one that was to come in his place. Now, is there still a mystery to it? Amen. And when we're talking about the infinite, self-existing God, then yeah, absolutely, we should still have some questions. But by the grace of God, every single one of us will be together in heaven, and we will look forward to God revealing those mysteries to us at a later time. Amen? Amen. Acts of the Apostles, page 51 and 52 says, It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men into all truth, he shall not speak of himself. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a what? Is a mystery, and we should all be okay with that. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture, put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. She's saying, you know what? There is a lot more to learn about the Holy Spirit, right? There's a lot more that we could understand, but not on this earth. Not right now. And as we start to encroach in areas that we cannot fully understand, especially when it pertains to God, we are finding ourselves on a dangerous path. Colossians 2 and verse 2, our scripture reading, says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. All throughout the Bible, and I'm going to leave it to you to go find these. There are these, uh, someone would say like a, tri a, verse, a triadic verse or something, that there is these verses that show all three of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I really love this one because the Bible is clear about the Holy Spirit, that he is the mystery of God. He's the part of the Godhead that we do not need to fully understand because the work of the Holy Spirit, as it says, his threefold work, he's to, re he's to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, to convict the world of sin because we don't see Jesus anymore. So once again, even in convicting us of sin, it's because of Jesus. He's pointing us back to Jesus. Of righteousness, because of Jesus. And of judgment. It was when uh, Jesus was hung on the cross, it says, the prince of this world, he will be judged. Everything about the work of, of, of the Holy Spirit is to point all men back to Christ. So our focus isn't to be on the Holy Spirit. The relationship that we have to God is through the Holy Spirit. Let's let the Holy Spirit do his work. And we'll leave the understanding and the deep things of God, we'll leave that for a future time. Uh, we just heard it this morning, it's better to be safe than sorry, amen? Especially when it comes to things that are just too deep for us to understand. And this brings up something that is happening in this church is, is uh, what, like what she just said, these fanciful theories, ideas about God. And, and what they're trying to do is bring all our attention to the aspects and the essence of who God is in a way that the Bible does not share with us. There may be some texts that can be used to, uh, to allude or to say certain things. Um, one of these, um, some people would call this the one true God movement. This is the 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6 movement. What they, uh, this is something that has been growing so fast, the movement that has just been taking off within the church and what they are suggesting, that we go back, that what we as a church teach right now is heresy when it comes to the understanding of the Godhead. That what we are teaching now is error. Now, what do we, as we understand, there is a system in the Bible that, uh, the, the, a name that is given to a system in the Bible that teaches the world error. 
that has given the cup of abominations of false doctrines to the world, and that's called Babylon. If we begin to teach that the Seventh-day Adventist church is teaching error or that we have a heresy in our church and what we are teaching, then what are we essentially calling the church? Babylon. It's a dangerous road as we go down this way. And as it says, there's one God who is the Father. Yes, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6 says that. And one Lord, Jesus Christ. Yes, absolutely. Jesus, the Bible tells us, is the Son of God. Now, if we say that Jesus was begotten, literally, of the Father sometime in eternity past, do we, in our minds, have to understand the physical substance and nature of God? You would have to. That there is a God, this singular God, as the Unitarians or the Arians would, Arians would teach, there is a singular God, and there was some divine mitosis, and now they've split off into two. That is touching into the realm of something that yours and my minds could not even comprehend. And there's nothing in the Bible that leads us to say, hey, we need to for focus on the form of God rather than his character and the character that he's wanting to recreate in you and me. And so we can go down a host of lists of texts. I was actually going to put them on there, but I decided not to, uh, that talk about verses that people would use to suggest that this is why Jesus was literally begotten of the Father, which means that Jesus had a beginning. Can you be the self-existing God, the I am, the Yahweh of the Old Testament, if you had a beginning? No. So you can look at all these texts and say, okay, is this talking about the form and physical substance of God, or is it talking about what God is seeking to do for the redemption of fallen man? Why is Jesus called the Son of God? Who was it that was to receive the inheritance in the Old Testament? It was the oldest son, right? Uh, in Hebrews, it says that Isaac was called Abraham's only begotten son. Was Isaac Abraham's only begotten son? Or was he his only son, literally? No, Ishmael was even the oldest son. The only begotten son. He was the unique, peculiar son that was to receive that inheritance. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, guess what his inheritance is to be? It's to be this earth. He's inheriting the earth. He's buying it back from us losing it. And guess who he's going to give it back to? He's going to give it back to you and me. He's identified himself as the Son of Man. Why? Because Jesus lived his life. Every single thing in his life was not to come down and show himself as a God but it was to show himself as a man and that man can live a life without sin, completely victorious. Everything that God does and every way that God reveals himself is so that we can understand salvation, that we can understand redemption. And if we see, as we have seen, that Jesus is the Yahweh of the Bible, of the Old Testament, and that if we say that he was formed or split off and created sometime in eternity past, then it goes against this verse right here in Isaiah 43, and I want us to all to turn there, and we can see this uh, as plain as day from the Word of God. Isaiah 43, verse 10 through 14. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 10, it says, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. So who's speaking? The Lord, which is? That's Yahweh, right? Jehovah. And my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Now notice this. Before me there was no God. No God formed. Neither shall there be after me. Now notice what the next verse says. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Who do we know of as our Savior? Acts 4 and verse 12 says, There is none other name given among men whereby we might be saved. Jesus Christ is our Savior. And we just saw multiple texts already that Jesus is the Yahweh. He is the one speaking here. And Jesus is saying, Before him there was no God formed. After him there was no God formed. If Jesus had a beginning, if he was literally begotten from the Father, then this verse can't be true. And notice what it continues on saying in verse 12. It says, I have declared... 
I have saved, I have showed, when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer. Who is our Redeemer? Jesus. The Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles, and the Chaldeans, whose cries in the ships. Jesus is our Redeemer. He is our Lord. And he is telling us that there is no other God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as far as we can understand them from what is revealed in the Word of God, work collectively together as one. There is one God. And when we look at Isaiah 57, verse 15, it says, God, thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity. Are we going to be able to fully understand a God that inhabits eternity, that stands outside of time. Can any of us wrap our mind around entering into another dimension where time does not exist? No. So there are going to be mysteries about God that we should absolutely be okay with. And God is revealing just enough. He has given us just enough so that we can understand how it is that the Godhead is working for the salvation of our souls. And that's as far as we need to know. Amen? Amen? Education, page 125, says the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan. The restoration in the human soul of the image of God. The burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. In other words, if someone says that we need to look at these texts and these texts point to some time in eternity past, outside of time in another dimension, I, we can say you've gone way too far. That is not the burden of the Bible. The burden of the Bible is for us to understand the redemption of fallen man. And that is what's right in front of us. Councils on Health, page 222, says the Godhead, the what? Now look how she describes the Godhead. It says, The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. All three of them working collectively, ecod, as one, united for the salvation of you and me. Book 7 of Adventist Bible Commentary, 441, paragraph 9, says, There are three living persons of the heavenly trio, in the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by faith, by living faith, are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Our understanding of God, the Godhead, should go as far as how is it that that understanding can help me live a new life in Christ. That's as far as it should go. And you know what? There may be some truth. There may be not of all these ideas about who God is. But guess what? That's none of my business. Our business is what is it that we can do to be closer to God and to receive his free gift of salvation. That is the only business that we should have right now. We will have eternity to understand the eternal God. And guess what? As you go through eternity there is still an infinite amount more for us to learn. And so what, what else do you think you could understand as a finite individual here on this fallen world? It's not going to be much. And all we need to know, as the Bible says, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15, that the scriptures are to make us wise unto salvation. That is our only business right now. And so we can praise the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the work that they are doing on our behalf. Amen? They are working collectively together. All we need to do is surrender our lives to the will of the Holy Spirit that we should conform our lives to the life of Jesus because one of these days, as Revelation 22 says, we will see the face of God. We will see the form of God. It's not going to be now. We don't need to understand it now, but we should all look forward to that day that God is going to reveal himself in a way that we could never understand. I hath not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man 
the things that God has prepared for you and me, for those that love him. Amen? So let us wait for that day with patience, but let us persevere through the trials that are before us, through the winds of doctrine that are blowing all over the place. Let us stay together, functioning together as a body, because it's only as a body that we will have the greatest impact on giving the gospel to the entire world. Amen? Amen.